This is Fessel Khan for Lights Out in association with Shamrock Boxing and with me, I'm delighted to be joined, I'm honoured and privileged to be joined by George Sefton. George Sefton, the stadium announcer of the greatest football club in the world, my football club and his football club, Liverpool Football Club. Uh, George, good afternoon to you, my man. How are you, Hello, How are you doing, George? I'm good. I'm uh, doing very well in lockdown. I'm looking forward to getting back out of here and getting uh, on with the football. It's been a strange 10 weeks. Um, this situation yeah. has never occurred to us. Being in lockdown, this whole coronavirus, pan coronavirus pandemic situation, how have you managed to, to deal with it? I mean, obviously, from being every Saturday at Anfield to, uh, you know, announcing the greatest team in the world right now, to obviously being in lockdown and being stuck at home for the last 10 weeks. How's it been for you? It's been very good for me, strange as it may seem. Obviously, apart from the worry about not finishing the season, uh, I've done well. I've, I say I've been a good lad. I've stayed in. My wife has looked after me very well. Um, we've avoided the, the virus. The family have looked after us. You've gone a bit shopping and went once in a while. And um, it's strange, even as a German Liverpool fan, uh, even sent me uh, a handmade mask, which I'm very proud of, which, um, which is in my car ready for when I get back to Anfield. And uh, I've been tidying up. I've done a lot of cleaning up of my uh, computer files, got rid of all the old emails, and a big clear out of the CD shelves. And more important, I've managed to finish the book that I've got coming out hopefully uh, May next year, which is uh, to coincide with the end of my 50th season. So obviously the big worry there was that we wouldn't get a 50th season because there was a time when we thought that maybe this season would be cancelled. So next season would be my 49th again, so I wouldn't get to the 50. But anyway, that's all sorted. So... Um, I've, I've used design quite well, I think, and, and it's been nice. I said to somebody um, on the local TV, uh, the regional TV channel a few weeks ago, that being a Liverpool fan is not good for your blood pressure. <laughs> you know, all the excitement, the last minute equalisers, the flying saves, the dodgy penalties, the whole shooting match. So... Uh, being away for a few weeks has probably done my blood pressure a lot of good and I'm quite, you know, I'm reasonably relaxed now. I'm, I'll say just looking forward to uh, getting back back to back to work. I mean, I have to agree with you, being a Liverpool fan is never easy for, you, for your blood pressure, especially oh, no. if, you've, if you've been through what we've been through over the last couple of years, but it's been a delight yeah. for the last few years. Um, and as you obviously just uh, said, we're scheduled to get restarted with the Premier League on June the 17th. But we were yeah. at a stage where we were thinking that wait of 30 years will have to continue because it it looked at one point as if the season could have been null and voided. But how yes. happy are you that the, Prem, that the Premier League is going to finish and Liverpool it's, can get the opportunity to finally end that 30-year wait of winning the Premier League? Yeah, I'm very confident now that obviously this last few days uh, people have sent... Uh, fixtures, you know, to me, it's, they've been published. The TV companies are publishing their schedules, um, and it's all all of a sudden uh, got into place. You know, the, the players are training; they're doing proper training again, and um, it's it's looking really good. I just things could still go wrong, of course, but the um, the wheels are in motion. And it, it could be very quick, and you know, it, in theory, we could win it our first home game, or you know, even at, uh, at the derby match at Goodison Park, which apparently is going to go ahead of Goodison Park now, not a neutral venue, which is good. Um, so all in all, things are just starting to to look up, and the, you know, the scenario is a lot brighter than it was a month ago. 
being a Liverpool fan like yourself, I mean, I know how much pride the city takes in its football. I mean, I had yeah. the, the privilege of being there last year for the parade when Liverpool brought home the, the their sixth European yeah. Cup. I know how much how important it is to football to the city, not only just for Liverpool fans to, but obviously to Everton fans. Yeah. What do you think the outcome would have been had the season been null and voided, especially with Liverpool being only two games away from winning the league? I just, I don't think, I think there would have been so much uproar uh, from the Liverpool side of uh, the fence. I know there'd be a couple of Everton fans would have been making jokes and would have been quietly pleased. But I I get a lot of traffic on social media and uh, I know a lot of Everton fans. I'm a friend of Bill Kenwright, the Everton chairman. I went to school with him. So I've got no axe to grind with Everton Football Club at all. But uh, the general feeling amongst Evertonians was that Liverpool, 25 points ahead, there's no way you could deny them the title. So I think it'd be okay. And the other thing is, Everton are just starting to come to life again. I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember when Everton and Liverpool were one and two in the league, and they that was the way you know you expected it to be. And now Everton have got um, an investment. Into, into the club. They've got a world-class manager and uh, they've got a new stadium on the horizon. So in another couple of years, it might go back you know, to the way it was you know, 30 years ago when we were you know, two, the two biggest clubs in the league. I'd really like to see that because for the, you know, for the sake of the city, uh, it'd be good to, you know, to see that happen. And, and uh, I look forward to it. Just hope I... My uh, my heart holds out long enough to see it all. <laughs> oh, well, I, th I think if you if you managed to if you've been able to manage to live through the last six or seven years being a Liverpool fan, I think you can yeah. get through anything. Um, as I, as I mentioned, you've obviously been doing what you've been doing since 1971. Um, mm. So you've lived through some great times where you've seen some great teams. I mean. Debates all day long that Liverpool's 80s team was the best, you know, the 70s yeah. were very good. You know, you've been there through um, Joe Fagan, Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley, Kenny Dalglish, of course, Rafa Benitez, and now uh, Jurgen Klopp, managers that have achieved so much with the club. On paper, what is the best team you've seen since being a, a Liverpool fan? Um, I think it's on my screen is playing I won't be able to give me a second I don't know what it's doing that's better um, yeah I always used to think that the, the team in the mid 80s was the greatest team I've ever seen but I think this lot would give them at least a run for their money it's a different style of football uh, it's a lot faster obviously it's a different different world now but this I wouldn't swap this team for anybody. I really wouldn't. I know there's been some great players over the years. I always say to people over and over again, Kenny Dalglish is the best player I've ever seen. Not just at Anfield. He's the best player I've ever seen. And I'm old enough to have seen Johan Cruyff, Pelle, uh, Eusebio, uh, Messi. We've seen Lionel Messi at Anfield a few times. I wouldn't swap any of them for Kenny Dalglish. And you know, that team was something else, but I think this is just about as good as it, it gets. I mean, they're talking about summer signings at the moment this week in the, in the window. And you think, you buy all these guys, where are you going to put them? Because this team is just about the perfect team. You have the balance, uh, the, you know, the fitness, the speed. The, the interaction, the way they, they play together as, as a team, the, 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 the interaction between the players, I say, it's just about as good as it gets. And obviously, you know, with, uh, with Jürgen in charge, you wouldn't expect anything else. Of course, the, um, as I've mentioned a few times now, we're uh, two wins away. <laughs> I'd, I'd, love yeah. saying, I'd love to keep on saying that. Two wins away now from ending that 30-year run. Now, how impressed have you been with the teams, with the, with this current side to coming so close last season and still managing to win a European Cup and to continue yeah. that, to show that same form of consistency over two seasons? And we've only lost two Premier League games. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I must admit, last summer, when we came so close and we scored so many points, and City were, no, were not showing any sign of falling off, and I thought, you know, we've, we've had it. We've, this is as close as we're going to get. Surely we can't do any better than we've done this year. And obviously, this season, they just, you know, at the start of the season, they gritted their teeth, got out there, and got stuck in. And um, I, I know a lot of people don't think much of the World Club Championship, but I do. Uh, but we won the Super Cup. We won the World Club Championship. Uh, we're on the verge of being Premier League champions. And it's, it's, just, it's just a fantastic, you know, fantastic season. It's, sh it's a shame that it's probably going to be most remembered for what didn't happen, i.e. there was no football for three months and no crowds in Anfield. That would be what goes down in the history books. But it's been an absolute privilege to watch them all this year. It really has. And the way they applied themselves was fantastic. And... Um, the way the, the club now is going about their business, they've been very careful of keep, keeping all the players happy, making sure they were all fit, you know, keeping in touch with them day after day after day, and working their way back into full compact training at the right speed. And here we are, we're on the verge of putting it to the test now. I have to ask you this question, you know, with it, with this team being as good as it is, and I can only see it getting better and better because obviously some players are still at a good age. Yeah. Who you said that Kenny Dalglish is the best player you've, you know, not only just as a Liverpool player but in your lifetime you you said yeah. you've seen and Liverpool have had some phenomenal players over the last few years, over the last twenty thirty years. You know, you look at John Barnes, Steven yeah. Gerrard, Luis Suarez, Fernando Torres, uh, Jamie Carragher. In this current Liverpool team, who do you have as the best player right now? And that is a difficult question because even I find yeah. the answer, but who's the one player that you look at for the most when you're up in your announcer's box? That's, that's a very difficult question. Obviously, you've got to go... Uh, you know, Mo Salah stands out in front of everybody. Oh, Shadi Amane is a, you know, it's a bit inconsistent sometimes he's on very quietly but he when he's on form he's the best in best there is uh he can go right through the team but then but i like players like uh andy robertson he puts a shift in and he's he's not the big glamorous you know international playboy type he gets he does what he he has to do and he does it really well puts his body on the line uh, like you know, the the, uh, the likes of Jamie Carragher used to do, but then of course the, the bottom line is Virgil Van Dijk is world class, mm -hmm. and he's more than world class. Uh, obviously, I'm old enough to have seen all the big centre back partnerships. You're know, like, you're going back to Emily Hughes and Phil Thompson, uh, Hanson and Lawrence and. You, you name it, they've all been there. But Virgil van Dijk, you watch him, and he, he, he looks like he doesn't break sweat week after week after week. And he, he, his passing is, is amazing. I've only met the guy once. I was um, coming down in the lift in the main stand uh, last, last August uh, with somebody else. Elvis Costello, as it happened, but that's another story. But uh, we stopped at the, the first floor, and this bus chair comes in with two little girls in it. Anyway, calling them in is their dad, and it's Virgil. And I look at him, I mean, I'm a big bloke, but I'm looking up to him and introduced myself, had a quick chat on the way down. And he, he's just such a presence. What, the, the, what was the old phrase? He's a big unit. Uh, and he really is. He must be horrendous to play against. Absolutely frightening. Any of it. There are pictures in the archives of opposition players just standing next to him and looking at him. And it, it's just an absolute joy to watch him week in and week out. And I, 
you know, as, the longer he stays with Liverpool, the, the happier I'll be because he, he's, he, he's happy, he's got all the trophies, obviously he's settled. Uh, I can't imagine anybody wanting to leave this current setup. So mm. I think we've, we've got him for a, a few years and we can build and rebuild the team around him if, if necessary. But as you say, but we're all at the right age. I mean, you look at Trent, he's, you know, he's still up. You know, wet behind the ears, lad. And he, he just watch him, and he, again, he's he's matured so much. He, and we want uh, we want eleven world class players. I think we have got eleven world class players at the moment. But the next stage after that, I banged on about it for years and say what you need is a bench that frightens the the, the opposition to, to death. When you you you've, you've got eleven world class players in front of you, and you stop. And look at the, the substitute bench, and they're, they're all international. <laughs> You're thinking, Well, I'm, you know, we've got no chance here. I mean, City have been doing it for a while now, but we've overtaken them, we have not blown them out of the water this year, really. Huh? But obviously, you know, we're coming to that uh stage of the summer where the season is going to get complete, and then we'll move on into the summer transfer window. Um, we obviously never strengthened as much as we would have liked to have last summer, but this team's proved why we didn't need to. But yeah. I'm, I'm hoping Jurgen Klopp is looking to bring in a few. We heard that Timo Werner's on his way to Chelsea last season. But not only yeah. a member of staff, but being a fan, you know, you said mentioned the, the bench because right now it is going to be hard for, you know, unless you're Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo, I don't see anyone just walking into this Liverpool yeah. team right now. Who would you like to see brought in the summer, brought to Liverpool Football Club? Um, there's talk of uh, Jadon Sancho coming here, mm-hmm. um, which is good. He's a, he's a class player. Um, again, we've been talking about uh, Traore, Adama Traore down at Wolves. He had a big strapping centre forward. So I'm not sure that's... Um, you know, um, Jürgen's style of play would suit him, but but I, he looked down. There's so many kids coming to. I mean, we've got Harry Wilson down at Bournemouth on loan. He might want. He might come back. There's Curtis Jones is coming through. You know, he's turning into an outstanding player. Curtis Jones will walk into any other team. Um, so I'm wondering if you know, in the circumstances, they're going to be. Splashing out money, although as I understand it, there's a couple of players who are going to be moving onwards and upwards, and they, they'll be they'll have money in the kitty for them. But I think they might have to let the dust settle first before they they go and buy any big stars. And I, again, uh, he, he won't want any uh, huge big heads in the team. He, he wants team players. So I think it, it's a question of sussing out the guys they're looking at like Sancho and just thinking you know if they'd uh, they 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 fit into the, the Liverpool set set up I know they there's, there's a saying going back years that the people have to want to play for the red shirt. I know there's not there's not been many over the years but um poor Michael Robinson who died recently he was one um he heard Liverpool after him. This is in the 80s. You know, uh, and he didn't ask his agent to get on the case and negotiate a fee. He just went, you know, packed an overnight bag and went to uh, the summer training camp where they were and said, where do I sign? John Aldridge was the classic. You know, Liverpool lad, Liverpool fan all his life. Uh, he'd been rejected by Liverpool as a teenager. And then he heard from uh, his boss in Oxford and Liverpool were interested. And again, jumped in the car, drove up to a motorway service station, met up with uh, the Liverpool representatives, and they started showing him the paperwork. He said, forget all that, just give me a pen. I want to sign. You want people like that? And, uh, and I, I wonder if Timo Werner's you know, done the opposite to that. I don't know, but uh, I'm, I'm quite sad he's not coming because it looked like he was on his way here uh, all year. And of course, with being German, he had a head start because uh, he knew Jürgen and Jürgen knew him and they were, they were both 
wise to what, ever, uh, what the other guy was like and, and how he operated, but that appears to have died with that. But I won't be leaving it till it's signed on the dotted line for Chelsea. But we'll see. Let's see. It could be, it could be an interesting summer. I think we've obviously we've got to a stage now where if a player's not being brought in and it's on Jurgen say so, we need to have full yeah. effect because of what he's achieved with us since he's been at Liverpool. And um, again, since 1971, he was there in 2005 on the second leg against Chelsea. Oh, the, yes. The Dortmund game, he was there last last season against Barcelona. I mean, the, the two, four, three games against Newcastle in the Premier League. What is the greatest night for you that you've witnessed at Anfield? Because I know you've witnessed quite a few. Yeah, uh, I have to say Barcelona for all sorts of reasons. I mean, People talk about St. Etienne in 1977, which was a fantastic occasion. Again, the place was buzzing. Uh, I nearly didn't get in there because I couldn't get my car through the queues to get in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I very nearly had to mow people down. I was standing on the running board of my car saying, let me through, let me through. But the, uh, the way that went, you know, the, the, the Fairclough goal and, and just scraping through. Olympiakos in 2005 was quite something. We were very nearly dumped out of the competition. Chelsea semi-final in 2005. The way it happened, the way we scraped through. I still think that was a dodgy goal that got us through. I really don't care. You know, then the, um, I said to somebody yesterday, if you look on Google for the best ever rendition of You Never Walk Alone, uh, one of them comes up with that Chelsea game. At the end of the game, yeah. remember the scenario, there was six minutes added time. And on you can see the two managers, um, Rafa, looking at his coaching staff and saying, what did George just say? Six minutes? Having the aesthetics there. And then just a bit further down, Jose Mourinho. Said, six minutes, and he's acting his players on to get everybody up on this, see if we can scrape the goal up. And then at the end of the game, I'm bang on you never walk alone. The ground nearly erupted. But at the end of you never walk alone, you can hear me screaming and shouting down the PA. Um, I was just aesthetic. You know, that was, I was saying that's the best night I've ever experienced in all my years of going to Liverpool. But Barcelona knocked it into a cocked hat. I mean, the way it fell out, it, we, you couldn't have written the script. You know, we're 3 0 down for the best of us on earth. Two of our star players at Croft. Everything was set against us. Um, it's just impossible. And then we scored the, that first goal. I think, oh, three one. That's all we've got. We're making inroads. Then the two quick goals from Genie after half time. Of course, you know, and of course we had an injury during the first half as well. Didn't help. Um, and then that corner from. Uh, Trent Alexander Arnold. I, I still, if I feel a bit fed up, I just bring up the video of that and watch it over and over and over again. And I still don't believe it happened even now. You could, if everybody else, well, everybody else on the pitch looked like they were frozen in time, just watching the ball go past. And Divot banging the thing in the net. And I remember thinking, it's going to be only too quick. It can't be a goal. It can't. And then it was. Um, then we, you know, we had what, 20 minutes to hang on and again the same scenario as Chelsea all Barcelona had to do was sneak one goal and they were through on the away goals bit but they didn't and then at the end you never walk alone the whole team this whole squad line up in front of the cop and join in and I've never seen anything like that and then after that I don't know how long you saw it go on for I banged on Imagine by John Lennon and the whole place was singing again. And for, for days after that, I was getting emails from all, all over the world saying that was fantastic. Even Piers Morgan apparently called me a genius on uh, Good Morning Britain the day after that, which is, uh, I think is a compliment. <laughs> I, I have to admit that um, that game against Barcelona was, well, yeah, I, was, I mean, I was, I was watching it the other night Obviously, because it'd been the the one year anniversary since we won the yeah. six, but I I don't think you can mention numbers 
number six without talking about Barcelona and as you said, against the best team in the world, two of our best players out injured. Got get one back, you're thinking okay, but then you know you look at it, it's Barcelona, they're gonna have they're gonna score at some point. I just think yeah. Liverpool when it comes to European nights at Anfield, it's just they, they it's freak the right the right word to use. They, they, there's just something different about Liverpool and the support. Yeah, it's it's turned into a tradition now. Um, over the years, I think probably going back to Saint Etienne. Actually, no, it goes back to 1965 when we gave AC, um, Inter Milan a good hiding in the European Cup semi final. Um, that was a fantastic night. It was all new to us then. Yeah, you know, we just not long been up from the old second division and here we are playing against the best teams in the world that was a, an amazing occasion the atmosphere was fantastic uh yeah we, we really gave them the run around and then we were actually cheated in the second leg there's no i don't think anybody disputes that now but the referee in the second leg you know gave it to milan and he was you know he was I don't know how much he got paid but he was apparently found sunning himself on a beach somewhere at the Italian's expense. But that was the start from my point of view of the, the big European night. It grew and grew. 77, we went on to win the thing. Um, and then, you know, as you say, 2005. I, I remember that night in particular. I was doing my best to get the atmosphere going. I had everything Everything turned up to volume 11. Uh, the, the crowd were in early. You know, we didn't like Chelsea anyway. <laughs> it didn't help. And we were, you know, we were nil-nil to start with, so we had chances. Um, you know, didn't have a goal to make up. And the way it all went, but then, as you say, Barcelona just topped everything. The difference, I, I just remember something now. Where I sit now in the corner of the Kenny Dalglish stand with the cop, uh, sometimes it gets quite noisy because people in the stand up and above my head that will stamp their feet and it's, it's quite noisy. But at the Barcelona game, they were jumping up and down and stamping at the whole thing, and my room was actually shaking genuinely shaking. And for a few minutes, I was frightened because it was, I've, I've actually been in an earthquake on that. That reminded me of it that night. I thought my box was going to fall out of the sky onto onto the ground. Obviously, it, it subsided eventually. But that was the that was the difference between all the other nights and the Barcelona game. It was just the the row, the, the, the intensity, everything. <clears throat> George, just hearing these stories, I, I mean, just brings goosebumps to me. Um, before we end the interview, I have to ask you to do me one favor. Not even it. We're at the cop end. Mohamed Salah scored the goal. That's yeah. But that's won us the league. Take over. Do your thing. You know. I mean. I hear you do it on TV. So to hear you yeah. do it, oh, wow. all that's face to face. Yeah. Mohamed Salah was different. Uh, it's this is very odd doing it in a quiet room on my own. Mm -hmm. Basically, it would be score of Liverpool's third. Mo Salah. <laughs> I didn't get a job in a boxing ring, though. <laughs> <laughs> it, I'm, it, I'm free as an amateur. It'd be interesting to see what you like in a boxing ring. You've definitely yeah. got sort of an announcer's voice to you. But no, um, George, uh, thank you very much for your time. Honestly, uh, it was it's, it's been a massive pleasure speaking to you. Um, I try my best to come down to Liverpool as as often as I can during the season. It's not easy with it being yeah. a three, four hour drive and as you know being the best team in the oh, world. I know. I'll, I'll say I went, I was in Luton about three years ago. I, I was at a function in the town centre with Jimmy Case and Phil Neal mm -hmm. and uh, one or two others. But they, uh, I was promised I'd be out of there by half past nine so I'd get home maybe half twelve in the morning, one o'clock. In the end I didn't get out till nearly midnight. I still remember that drive home now. I was so tired. Yes. You know, I stopped twice and just drank all the coffee I could get my hands on. So I, I appreciate what it's like. But uh, but I know it's it's good to hear that people like yourself will do that. 
I'm sure I hope we make it worth it. It's, it's I just hope we get uh, we get a crowd into Anfield again before too long. I don't think it's going to be this year, but maybe after Christmas into 2021 we'll be allowed to, you know, get the get the people back in again. It's going to be so weird the rest of this year, so weird. Well, fingers crossed. I mean, yeah. it can all come back to us as soon as possible. But also, fingers crossed, we get a a parade because yes. Like, in, it's been uh, 30 years and I, I think every Liverpool fan, even if it's for five minutes, just wants to see the team lift that. Oh, up. yes. Well, that's going to be so good. Mm, that will be a, 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 an enjoyable day. But uh, yes, George, thank you very much for your time. I won't keep you too long. It's okay. good to finally speak to you. And hopefully one day when I come down to Liverpool, it'll be a face-to-face -face interview with you. I hope so. That'll be good. George, thank you very much for your time. And uh, thank you very much for talking yeah. lights out and enjoy returning to your announcer's box come June the 17th and enjoy witnessing Liverpool win the league. Yeah. Cheers, Faisal. Thank you. Take care. Much. See you on the other side. Take care. You'll never walk alone. <laughs> Cheers.